The Thursday Murder Club is pulled into another case when Elizabeth gets a letter under her door from a dead man. (gasps) The book, The Man Who Died Twice, the author, Richard Osman. And you're listening to Lit Society. Let's get lit. Let's get lit. Hi, readers. This is Alexis. And this is Kari. And you're listening to Lit Society, a podcast about books and drama. Mm Mm-hmm. How are you today, Kari? Great. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. A little tired. Stayed up later than I needed to. But because I'm of sure pres- for good reasons, you were having fun with friends? No, because of procrastination. Oh. <laughs> Only procrastination. Oh, that happens. Whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever wear friendship bracelets? I did. And I used to make them on the school bus. Ah! Did you sell them or did you just give them away? I tried to sell a few to friends. <laughs> that um, sounds it, about right. Yeah. <laughs> My first unsuccessful wait, wait. business. You sold them to friends? Yeah, I tried. Did y'all see like, that? <laughs> to friends of my parents? Yeah, for sure. You know, support the youth. Friends of your parents. And who mm-hmm. taught you how to make them? Someone at school. Yeah. Yeah. So was it a school like project or something? No, just someone on the bus, probably. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. One of those little things. Well, cool. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in them when the book talks about them. So I was interested Mm -hmm. in them. So let's dive into our theme of the week. Each week, we select a theme to discuss inspired by the book that we're reading. And the theme chosen for this week is the origin of friendship bracelets. That's so cute. So I went to Wikipedia. It was a lot of information out there, but not really. And it, a lot of it all said the same thing. So I'm going to run with it, okay? Okay. Um, it says they became popular in the United States in the 1970s when um, wearing ethnic items was popular. Wow. And they were worn by teenagers, both male and female, and um, children. And then their popularity, well, today's popularity or modern popularity comes from the 1980s when they were seen during protests um, about the disappearance of Mayan Indians and peasants Mm -hmm. in Guatemala. The friendship bracelets were brought into the U.S. by um, religious groups and they used them in political rallies. and today they're not even they're not only popular among teenagers, but they're popular in the older generation as well. Mm-hmm. And they're popular throughout the world. Um, they're considered an ideal fashion accessory at the beach. And they're I told you that. <laughs> this you is reading? from this is from Wiki. It's not from Vogue. Okay, go ahead. No, Wiki is giving fashion advice as well. You didn't know? Mm-mm. Okay, that's the thing. Anyway, is it they're, so they're typically made of embroidery floss or thread, and it's a, considered a type of macrame. Did you mm-hmm. find them hard to knot, Kari? No. It was no, very easy. easy. Would you teach somebody else how to do it now? No. I don't teach no. skills unless they're profitable. <laughs> um <laughs> Like a kid could be you reading. Could the money. You could get the money. You could get the money. Friend, you could get the money. <laughs> no. Anyway, um, a little history. The friendship bracelet is said to have started as early as 481 to 221 BC. And macrame itself is said to have originated with the 13th century uh, Arab weavers um, as a practice that spread to both France and Italy. The friendship bracelet is said to be a descendant of Central American Indian crafts. Mm. And that is a brief theme of the week. Did you have any questions about it? Yeah. Has the art of creating friendship bracelets changed greatly over the centuries? It doesn't look like it. Oh, wow. It doesn't look like it. And what did they mean originally? What was the point of them? That I didn't find. I didn't find Mm. that source. Okay. So that's it. Why don't we take a quick, quick, why don't we take a quick break before we jump into the content, context and author? All right, let's do it. And 
Richard Osman book in the past. Do you have any context for this book or any additional information you want to share about the author? No, I do not. And that book she's referring to is The Thursday Murder Club, right? That was the name of it. It introduced yeah. us to the gang of characters in this book and in this series. And I know Richard was like an actor in show business. And one day he popped up as a writer and not a bad one. Although we didn't like the first book, we did notice the style of writing was like advanced for a debut novel from an actor. <laughs> you know, we didn't even know <laughs> wow. he was a literary person. And I don't mean <laughs> actors can't write, but, you know, each skill has its um, its disciplines, its focuses. So for him to just come out of nowhere to us as Americans, he is English uh, with this book series about uh, older people. Well, it was really cool. And then our theme that week was like the importance of having older friends. Yeah. It's really mm -hmm. cute. You guys go back yeah. and listen to that. Um, but I have nothing more to add about old rich. Can I Dick update? Osmond. <laughs> Can I update on his love life? Please do. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to share is that um, Richard Osmond. Yes. House of Games is a TV show, very popular quiz, uh, celebrity quiz show back in England. And while I was there, I had an opportunity to watch it pretty regularly with um, our friend. And in that show, he met his wife. She was a contestant on the show and it was so what? cute to watch them interact. And they ended up getting married in December of 22. So I thought that was cute. Wow. That's all I wanted to share. <laughs> Wow, she's beautiful. I'm looking at photos now. Well, yeah. lovely. Thank you. Okay. And their interaction was really cute on the show, too. So he's someone that it looks like may have never been married before. So in this, perhaps the second half of his life, he has completely changed careers. He's married. He started a family. He is like, I love this reinvention. <laughs> he's 50. He's 52 right now. Okay. Good for you, Dick. I love it. Thanks for sharing. Now let's hear a brief synopsis without spoilers before we take our deep dive. A member of the Thursday Murder Club has received a letter from a dead man inviting her over for tea. The mystery that unravels next will involve more than the police. To crack this case, they'll need a drug dealer, an international broker, an MI5, and $20 million in diamonds. Ooh. Alexis. Mm-hmm. Who do you think would enjoy reading this book? Well, if you enjoyed the first uh, book by Richard Osman at Thursday Morning Club, then you will certainly love this. And I also think if you like Agatha Christie type um, mysteries, you will enjoy this book. As There's well. a name for those, right? Cozy murders. Oh, cozy, is that right? Cozy crime. Yeah these cozy these crimes. are these are for true crime fans who don't like the grim, the gross, the oh. guts. Okay. You just want to sit in a comfy chair, wrapped in a blanket, and read about murder. <laughs> so I don't know. if you're into that, those cozy crime novels, yeah, I agree. I guess, I guess the the, the level of detail that they share, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And and it's not dark. You know, some murder mysteries are dark, and they stay with you mm -hmm. a while. Um, yeah. Book that comes to mind is A Monster of Florence, which uh, is rooted in it's a nonfic which is always a shaky place to start because you know mm. it happened. Or True. perhaps Monday's Not Coming, which is a book we enjoy, but it's dark. It is very so dark. So this ain't that. that hurt this my is a fun love and murder mystery. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Kari, why did you choose this book? I chose it because of our listeners. Listen, you guys are mad, some of you. Uh, we did not like the Thursday Murder Club. And you thought, well, then we're stupid. And, you know, I respect <laughs> it. <laughs> Especially over on YouTube, the girls had comments. I think we got ratioed over there. Uh, <laughs> so there are a lot of thumbs down on that video. We stand 10 toes down in our dislike of it. But I, I thought, do. I do. <laughs> I thought. We did love the characters. And if yeah. so many people are have this visceral reaction, they must have read the other books in the series. Um, so let me go ahead and try, you know. And now if it's 20 characters that don't make no sense, I will <laughs> not finish this book. I'm not going to waste my time again. Uh, but I'll give it a try. And so that's where we are today. 
Okay, well, that's cool. Well, are you ready to take a spoiler-filled deep dive into the man who died twice? Yes, baby. My Alexis is tired today, (laughs) y'all. She forgot which book she read. How long ago have you finished this book? Oh, finished the book last week, Thursday. See? See? It's hard. We read a book a week. I just want to throw that out there. So once you already in another book, your emotions ain't even tied up in the book you talking about like it was before. It's not. However, I too am a procrastinator and I just finished this book yesterday. So let's go ahead and get into it. (laughs) Now, this was my second reading. Uh, But yeah, I, I also didn't really harbor on the friendship bracelets. But since Alexis brought them out in the theme of the week, I'll go ahead and sprinkle the that into the story. So let's start the deep dive. Part one, wine, cheese, and secrets. Ooh. So (laughs) you guys, I'm just now realizing I have no idea what the beginning of the book is talking about. There's a woman named Sylvia Finch. Um, She is as close to death, as steeped in death as anyone can be. In fact, You can smell death on her. It's in her hair and clothes. She wonders when's the last time something truly good happened to her. She then enters a security code and walks through the door. Listen, (laughs) I opened the book to start the show, right? And I'm looking, I'm like, oh, I remember that. Wait, what does she have to do with this? So who is this? (laughs) I don't know, Kari. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. I gotta Google it. Boop, boop, boop. Sylvia Finch. The man who died. Who is this? Oh, brother. (laughs) All right. Yeah, I'll bring up Sylvia at the end. Sorry, Sylvia. You're not a character in the book. I think this is actually a a mistake to put you in such a prominent position as the forward. But we'll try to remember your name at the end, even though it doesn't matter. Hey, you guys. Let's move on. So now into the book. That was the foreword. That was like the prequel to the story. Here we go. The Thursday Murder Club is convening. They're at a restaurant and the waitress, Poppy, is terrible. Joyce is thinking of getting a dog or getting an Instagram. She doesn't know which. Everyone shares their opinion. Now to remind you all, these are the members of the Thursday Murder Club. You have Joyce. She's flirty. She's spunky. She's got a daughter named Joanna, and she writes letters to her dead husband, not because she feels she can read them, but because she loved communicating with him. And so she just continues that practice. It's really healthy, and I actually love this idea. I think it's beautiful. It's also a way for her to diary her day. Um, But instead of just writing to no one, she writes to her deceased husband, and it's really cute. Um, Sometimes, though, she talks about men she meets and how cute they are. And then she'll talk about Jerry, who's her ex-husband in third person. So sometimes it's just for her, too. Yeah. Also, we have Ron. He's a stereotypical man's man. He doesn't cry. He hides his emotions. But really deep down, and even not so deep down, he's a cuddle bear. (laughs) (laughs) So he's like, he tries to be the protector of the group. Um, He can also be a little dense, but he has moments of brightness that make it all worth it. Then we have Abraham. Abraham was once a psychiatrist. He is the intellectual of the group. He does things cautiously and calmly. We have Elizabeth. Elizabeth is, uh, she is, who was married to Brad Pitt? (laughs) Angelina Jolie. Oh, Elizabeth. (laughs) Elizabeth is an aged Angelina Jolie from the 90s. So she is like <laughs> still cute. She ha- She's a Dane. Don't nobody know that. She's like got prestige in the English court. Uh, she also was a member of MI5 and her friends do know that. To pass the time these days, she solves cold cases with her buddies, the aforementioned group. So back to the convening of the Thursday Murder Club. So Ron says to Joyce, remember Joyce is like a dog or Instagram. Which one, guys? Ron says, don't get a small dog. They're like small men. Always something to prove. Abraham is like, well, you can't get a dog because of this formula I've created, which shows your dog will outlive you and you must never, never outlive your dog. Elizabeth's mind, however, is elsewhere because she's just received a letter from a dead man named Marcus Carmichael. 
she's going to accept the invitation in the letter. Mm. Elizabeth arrives to the home of Marcus Carmile and is greeted at the door by the man himself, quote unquote, Marcus Carmile. He's tan with a head full of beautiful salt and pepper hair. He's George Clooney, you guys. She should have never known or she should have known he'd never go bald. (laughs) They sit. He hands her wine, her favorite wine. And she's like, what do you want, points uh, for knowing which wine I liked? I mean, we were married for 20 years. That's (laughs) right, you guys. It's her (laughs) ex-husband. Truthfully, today, Elizabeth is married to the love of her life. His name's Stephen, and he suffers from dementia. Um, So now she's sitting in a room with a dangerous man she knows to be her ex-husband. And he fine, fine, and he know it. And he think no one can resist his fineness. And she's like, get me out of here. It's stupid. (laughs) So (laughs) So Marcus Carmichael is not at the house. Yeah, there is no Marcus Carmichael. In fact, we find the truth. Uh, relatively quickly about Marcus. Marcus was a man that washed up out of the Thames River dead. Um, Her team back in the day, Elizabeth's team cleaned up the scene and she stood respectfully next to the widow at his funeral. However, Marcus Carmile never exists. That widow was like an intern from accounting. They staged the whole scene (laughs) in order to throw, I believe, like the Russians off of some trail. You keep calling him Carmile. Carmile. You keep calling him Carmile. Maybe it's my mic. It's Marcus Carmichael. Carmile. Mm. I I probably am saying Carmile. I ain't going to blame my mic because it's easier to say. Yeah. You know what? It don't matter because he never lived. Marcus (laughs) Carmichael. (laughs) Okay. The man she's sitting across from, of course, again, is Douglas, her ex-husband. He was a terrible husband. Always good at telling a story. (laughs) This house they're sitting in, she realizes, is a safe house. Douglas knows Elizabeth has been calling in favors for her quote-unquote murder club. And in exchange for secrecy, he needs her to babysit him. He's in trouble. Elizabeth isn't phased. She's like, won't you tell me about it? Of course you are. So in walks who? Alexis, Poppy. Poppy, the terrible waitress. <laughs> and then there is a great little back and forth between the three of them. Um, but once Poppy walks in, Elizabeth is like, that explains a lot. You're not a waitress. So <laughs> <laughs> um, let's take a break from that scene and visit our friend Abraham. He's the intellectual of the group. He's cautious, cripplingly so. He once ran away to England to get away from the woman he loved, and he has regrets later in his life. But he knows how to drive, and the murder club has reminded him to live. So he's driving now to the big city, not London, but just like a bigger town nearby. Mm -hmm. He discovers contactless payments. And can I tell you, Abraham, when I discover contactless payments, I too was excited. (laughs) He reads salacious novels in a local bookshop and buys them. He feels good. His brain feels alive. Use it or lose it, he thinks. Mm. He passes teenagers on the street and feels no fear. There have always been young men on the street. He may even try opium again, he thinks. But where (laughs) will he get it? You know what? No worries. He'll ask his police friends. It's good to have police friends. (laughs) He's a new man. But then one of those teenagers rides up to him on a bike, rips away his cell phone, hits him, kicks him in the back and his head. Mm. He wants to move, but he's unprotected. Someone now is calling an ambulance. He thinks to himself, he won't throw caution to the wind again. He should have stayed safe. Mm. That was really sad. sad. Mm -hmm. Back to Elizabeth and Douglas. Poppy reminds Elizabeth that there are orders to follow and Elizabeth must not tell what she hears in this room to her friends. Elizabeth assures Poppy that she'll be telling her friends the minute she walks out the door. (laughs) Okay. In fact, Joyce will be thrilled to hear the government has a file on her. (laughs) Besides, Elizabeth says, Poppy hasn't gotten an order right all week and it's silly to start now. (laughs) Part two, Connie, coffee and concussion. Mm. So now we meet. So there's still a lot of characters in this book, but so far they're all necessary and we know them from the first book. So I would even at this point say if you plan on reading the second book, it helps to have the backstory and the characters by reading the first. Yeah, that's the Thursday Murder Club. I felt like that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because now we're sitting at a stakeout between two officers, Chris and Donna. Chris is in love with a woman named Patrice. Who's Patrice? (laughs) 
<laughs> Donna's mom. I think they met at the end of the last book. That's right. This is also where we find out uh, Donna and Patricia, P- Patrice are black. And usually I'm like, oh, that's convenient. But uh, it aids in the story because actually they're in a small town and basically the countryside of England. Mm-hmm. Um, Donna's got to travel miles to find anyone who even knows what to do with her hair. No one can relate to her culture, to her as a person. She's surrounded by a pretty selfish, gross men in her um, her industry as an officer. Um, so she's lonely. Uh, But she likes Chris. Chris is her partner. He has seniority over her. He is fair, kind, and just a good friend. So she introduced Chris to her mom. What's the worst (laughs) that could happen? (laughs) Well, the worst did happen because Chris is madly in love with Patrice. And all he talks about is her her mom and how beautiful she is and the secret stuff they say to each other. And (laughs) Donna's like, this is gross. Maybe I should transfer. (laughs) Um, so they're in front of a woman named Connie's house. Now, Connie is a well-known drug dealer in the area. Um, she's got teens driving up to her house every day to pick up packages and deliver them to the police nowhere. Um, but they're holding out because they want to get her on a murder charge because she killed these brothers, they believe, um, these illegal activity brothers. (laughs) Uh, and so they're holding out on the drugs mm -hmm, to get her for the murder case. Well, Connie's a little smarter than they thought because they hear a knock on the window. (laughs) Donna rolls down the window and a woman goes, hi, hi, I brought coffee. Hello, you guys need coffee and sausage wraps. Hi, by the way, I'm Connie, but you already know that. (laughs) So Um, Connie's been known. They've been outside. She said, don't worry. You haven't seen anything I didn't want you to see. Besides, here you go. And she hands them pictures of them. Them at the stakeouts, them on dates, them at their home. She's like, we can follow you too. Okay, bye guys. And actually Donna thinks to herself, I wish Connie wasn't a criminal because she seems a lot of fun and I need a friend. (laughs) She was like, I like her. Um, Well, Connie asked Donna, did she, that she, what kind of makeup she was wearing? Oh yeah. (laughs) Connie's like, I'm sorry, before I leave, what's that on your eyeshadow? What's that eyeshadow? And Donna tells her, she's like, it is striking. Okay, (laughs) bye. (laughs) So anyway, um, later, Chris is working out for his new girlfriend. You know, he's pretending to be a healthy person. This is, he must have read Atomic Habits because he's pretending to be a healthy person so that he'll be a healthy person. He's eating carrots, apples, You know, he hides Kit Kats no. under the spinach at the grocery <laughs> store so that if he runs into anyone, they'll think he's an adult. <laughs> Listen, but now he's got a hot girlfriend and he's got to work out and eat right, you know, or at least pretend. Mm-hmm. Um, So he's running on a treadmill and he gets a call. It's from his partner, Donna, also his girlfriend's daughter. She calls him sir, meaning it's official business. Donna informs him Abraham is in the hospital and Chris is running before he's even hung up the phone. Mm. So just to reiterate, Chris and Donna really, really, really love these old people. They are friends, you guys. So once they hear that Abraham's been hurt at the hospital, everyone is around Abraham. Thursday Murder Club. Um, He looks bad, by the way. He looks old. He's pale. He looks frail. Mm. And everyone is just so hurt. Ron, the super masculine one, is devastated and shows it by standing on the opposite side of the room with red eyes. He can't even approach his friend. Joyce and Elizabeth are holding Abraham's hands, one on each side. When the police walk in, Joyce and Elizabeth um, allow uh, Chris and Donna to hold those hands. And the officers ask Abraham if he remembers anything about the kids that attacked him. And Abraham's like, no, I don't remember anything (laughs) except what they were wearing, the type of bikes they had, (laughs) tattoo. Oh, and I know one of their names. (laughs) And Elizabeth thinks, that's my Abraham. So, yeah, he knows everything. He's very observant even when he's not trying. Mm -hmm. So the tattoos, the models of the bikes, the colors of the bikes. And then when um, he got kicked in the head, someone yelled out, hey, Ryan, come on. So he knows the one who kicked him is named Ryan. Him. The police have an idea who this Ryan is. It's one of Connie's runners. Elizabeth assures the officers that no one will be able to help Ryan once Abraham's friends get a hold of him. 
This is heartwarming because the elderly are capable and caring. The police love them again as dear friends, and they all are on board to bring justice to whoever hurt their dear Abraham. Exactly. Later on, Douglas and Elizabeth are going for a walk, and Poppy is trailing behind them wearing headphones to give them privacy. In their talk, um, Douglas explains a few things to us. First of all, why he needs a babysitter is because of Martin Lomax. Can you explain who Martin Lomax is, Alexis? Martin Lomax is like this uh, kingpin and he has stuff in different money in different areas. And he's holding this money or diamonds that, uh, oh, I won't go further, but he's this big kingpin. He's got a lot of power and a lot of people that he works with in different arenas of crime. Yeah. So he's a, exactly. He's a broker. So if um, the mafia in Russia wants to do business with the American mafia, they don't meet in an office building, you know, they exchange uh, valuable things including original Rembrandts, diamonds, as Alexis mentioned, with a broker, a neutral party. That neutral party then arranges for the exchange. And that neutral party is Martin Lomax. So he's rich, rich. He really rich. He also never leaves the house because he's in a dangerous business. Well, (laughs) why is Douglas in trouble with Martin Lomax? Can you explain that, Alexis? He stole that man, stole... (sighs) On an MI5 kind of search of his home, he stole diamonds from the man. Listen, home. Douglas is of an old time. And I don't know if I said this, but he's part of, you know, England's FBI. He's part of MI5. So MI5 has been, of course, looking into Martin Lomax. Uh, sometimes they visit his home when he's not there and snoop around or plant um, video cameras and, you know, mics, bug his house. Well, there were diamonds lying out on the table. And so Douglas took them. <laughs> <laughs> and more than that, he thought his mask was um, itchy. So he took that off, too. So Martin Lomax sends the MI5 a photo of Douglas clear as day in his house. And he's like, this man took my diamonds, give them back or there will be much to pay. Mm -hmm. Did you steal the diamonds? Elizabeth asks. Of course, responds Douglas. (laughs) They were just sitting there. Mm -hmm. Listen, the New York Mafia and the Colombian drug cartel, according to Martin Lomax, are now looking for Douglas. Truth is, they're looking for Martin Lomax because their business isn't with Douglas. So Douglas is in deep trouble because, uh, I'm sorry, Martin Lomax is in deep trouble because of Douglas. So it's in um, Martin Lomax's best interest to either kill Douglas uh, or better yet, find out where those diamonds are. Meanwhile, Joyce has been persuaded to join IG. Yay, she's super excited. I'm not going to dwell on this long. It's just a little joke in the in the novel. Her name was already ta- taken, of course, Joyce. So she tried her nickname, Joy, or Great Joy, and her daughter's birth year. So she's now on Instagram with the handle GreatJoy69. And she's looking forward to all the fun she's going to have. <laughs> yeah, you can deduce what will happen. <laughs> The officers, meanwhile, are questioning Ryan. It's going nowhere. They dismiss him, letting him walk free. Even Ryan, even Ryan's lawyer is confused. Like, you're letting my client go? Okay, bye. Yeah. Later, Poppy's explaining to Elizabeth and Elizabeth's friend Joyce how she ended up a spy. It was very un- uneventful. She answered a few questions, shared a few drinks, and she was working for the government. Poppy hates lying, but that's the job, says Elizabeth. But I hate the job, says Poppy. I don't want to be a spy. <laughs> this is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> so what would you like to do, they ask. I like writing poetry. I'd be the same way, says Joyce. <laughs> Get over yourself, interjects Elizabeth. You'd be a wonderful spy, Joyce. <laughs> Poppy has a tattoo. It's really cute. It's of a daisy. And Joyce asks, why not of a Poppy? And um, Poppy explains that her grandmother told her she'd be an idiot to get a tattoo, never get one. Her grandmother's name, by the way, is Daisy. So Poppy got a tattoo of a Daisy, told her grandmother, hey, Daisy, me Daisy. (laughs) A few days later, her grandmother rolled up her sleeve and had a tattoo of a Poppy and said, Poppy, me Poppy. If you're going to be an idiot, I'll be one too. 
That's adorable. Cute, cute. Later still, Douglas hears someone open the front door late at night. So time has passed. Doug- Douglas is safely in bed, or so he thinks. It sounds like a professional. He can tell. He's like, is this it? Is this someone sent by Martin Lomax? He wonders. He needs Poppy to reach the intruder before the intruder reaches him. So both him and Poppy are staying in the safe house. She's his handler. Um, Although he also needs a babysitter because he's done some illegal things that Poppy's not aware of, i.e. stealing the diamonds. Mm -hmm. Is this his end? Where are the diamonds? The intruder asks. Fright not. (laughs) <laughs> You're going to kill me anyway, and I'd rather someone else have the diamonds, Douglas says. <laughs> he is Douglas reckless. watches as the man pulls the trigger. Elsewhere, <laughs> this bromance between Abraham and Ron is adorable. So I remember Ron was standing on the opposite side of the um, hospital room. Mm. Well, he also got a cot and spent the night. He's not going <laughs> to let Abraham out of his sight. That's his bestie. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. The other besties, Ron's taking care of his friend while being very weird about showing emotion. It's hard being a man these days, expected to hug everyone. (laughs) Back at Elizabeth's house, she walks in to find her Stephen, her husband, playing chess with Bogdan. Can you explain Stephen and Bogdan, Alexis? Uh, We met Bogdan in the last book, and they... Stephen, of course, is Elizabeth's husband. Bogdan, I think he was a fixer guy in the yeah, complex. He's like the soup. Yeah. And so he befriended Stephen and they love playing chess together. So they always meet and play chess. And again, Stephen suffers from dementia, but he has uh, extended periods of lucidness for now. Um, and he's a great chess player. Mm-hmm. Bogdan takes really good care of him. They have a friendship, a close friendship also. When Elizabeth walks in, her husband, Stephen, actually is asleep. Elizabeth uses the opportunity to hand Bogdan $10,000 and ask him to buy Coke. He's happy to do it for her. <laughs> he doesn't need to know anything else. He's like, these two, no wonder they found each other. Because Stephen's more than likely pretending to be asleep so he can win at chess. <laughs> Then Joyce gets a call. It's Elizabeth. And she's not calling about Abraham, thank goodness. But she's calling about that intruder that walked in on Douglas. As the intruder was about to pull the gun, the trigger, uh, Poppy blew his head clean off. So a team arrives in what looks like an ambulance. It's not. It's like a special vehicle, cleanup vehicle. Then Joyce and Elizabeth meet Sue. When Joyce gets home, she notices a note in her pocket. Oh, by the way, Sue is part of MI5. She's like, she has the job that Elizabeth had when she was younger. So Sue is the new Elizabeth in a lot of ways. We'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. Uh, When Joyce gets home from that little interaction, um, She feels around in her sweater and finds a note that says, ring my mom with a number on it. Isn't that sweet, Joyce thinks. Poppy wants Joyce to call her mom. She calls Poppy's mom as asked. Her mom is like, my daughter does what? She what? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, Poppy just killed a man. So it makes sense that she'd want her mom to know she's okay and to contact her mom. But why Poppy wouldn't just call her mom herself? I don't know. And And that was her first kill. That was her first kill. First kill ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she's really shaken up. She's like, I already hate this job. Now I have to kill people. Well, Douglas, I think she (laughs) um, knows the process. And so it'd be so it makes sense for her to sneak a note because she really wants to talk to her mom because she's in this like desperate situation. Yeah. Yeah. It's discovered that the shooter did work for Martin Lomax. But why would Martin risk killing an agent if that agent hadn't stole from him? Everyone wonders. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth already knows Douglas is like a thief, (laughs) but everyone else is trying to defend Douglas and the agency. But now that Martin's actively trying to kill Douglas, it's like, we got to get rid of Douglas. Everyone wants to get rid of Douglas Mm -hmm. at this point. Back at the hospital, the gang is together and Ron is furious that Joyce got to see a dead body and he didn't. So Elizabeth gives him a mission (laughs) and hands him a folder filled with the address and details on Ryan. And he's Ron's like, great, because I really want to get Ryan. Thanks, Elizabeth. (laughs) For the first time, the reader now is alone with Connie. Um, Earlier that day, Connie got a call from Bogdan, who she has the hots for. And she's like, he's coming by and he wants drugs. (laughs) So weird. It doesn't seem like him, but whatever. So she um, gets this perfume, but it stinks. And then she like spills it all over herself, tries to get it off. Um, Anyway... (laughs) 
this is funny because uh, when Bogdan walks in, when he leaves, he's like, there was a terrible smell in there. And then he meets Ron, uh, Ron and they have a, a long chat. And then Ron is like, by the way, Bogdan, what's that smell? So anyway, it's just a little gag through this part of the book. But back to Connie getting ready for Bogdan. Um, she finds him extremely attractive and is so happy he's stopping by to purchase a few drugs. Um, the exchange is uneventful, but Connie's head is swirling. She's like, what does all of this mean? Is Bogdan in love with me? Bogdan takes the package to Ron, as I said, who's dressed like a plumber. When Ron rings the doorbell, so he walks away from that exchange and goes to a home dressed as a plumber with a bunch of drugs. Ron rings the doorbell. Ryan lets him in without a second look. Oh, it's the plumber. While in the bathroom alone, Ron flushes the drugs down the toilet and puts Abraham's credit card in the toilet system. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so there's no question about who Ryan is. <laughs> He's a terrible person. <laughs> he leaves and calls his friend Donna, the policewoman. When Ron calls Donna, Donna answers and is basically like, hi, Ron. And Ron's like, oh, no, this is the plumber. And they have this little <laughs> interchange where he's like, you need to go to Ryan's house because there's something happening over there. And Donna's like, well, I can't go over without cause, like with someone screaming. And Ron's like, yeah, yeah, screaming, yelling, all of it. It's crazy. <laughs> and she's like, OK, thank you for this anonymous tip. And they go over to Ryan's house and, of course, find drugs and uh, Abraham's credit card tying Ryan to the incident with Abraham. Moving on elsewhere. Elizabeth and Joyce enter a home. The fr- It's the safe house, by the way. The front door looks normal, but it's secretly made of steel. Joyce is chatting as they enter, but Elizabeth notices that there's a draft. The house is quiet and the back door is open. Both women find Poppy and Douglas dead. Both have been shot beyond recognition in the face. Elizabeth rushes to the operative who's watching from outside and lets them know, hey, roll down your window. Both of these people are dead while you're sitting here reading. Elizabeth and Joyce are then taken blindfolded to an underground layer of MI5. Sue is waiting for them down there. She's part of the team, of course, on this case, and Sue hands Elizabeth a locket, which Douglas wanted Elizabeth to have. To Elizabeth's disappointment, there's nothing magnificent about this locket. It holds a mirror, nothing more. Why did Douglas want her to have it? Where's your phone? Asked Sue. The (laughs) ladies feign forgetfulness due to old age. Oh, I don't know. We're old. We don't take our phones everywhere. Of course, when they found Douglas and Poppy, the first thing Joyce did was take a photo of the scene, you know, just in case someone tampered with it. She got a lot of photos, but she doesn't know where her phone is. She's old, dude. So... (laughs) What did he want to show you? Why did he ask you to visit the house? Sue asked. Perhaps he wanted to show you the diamonds. Oh, it will all be investigated, says Sue. This is more like it. Lance will quite rightly be a suspect, and I will add another suspect to the list. Probably the only other person who knew that Douglas was at Cooper's Chase and at St. Albans Avenue a confidant and an ex-wife of the dead man, a woman trained in breaking and entering, a woman trained in killing, a woman who has conveniently mislaid her mobile phone. She would be a suspect too, don't you think? She certainly would, agrees Elizabeth. As would you, of course, Sue. I imagine you have every skill I had and a few more they thought up in the meantime. Let's say you suspected that Douglas had stolen the diamonds. Let's say that, yes, confirmed Sue. She's happy now that the conversation is opening up a bit. A chance to observe Elizabeth a little better. Start to read her. Or let's say you knew already. Let's say you and Douglas were more than colleagues. You wouldn't be the first person Douglas has seduced. Let's say not everyone would make the same mistake you made, says Sue. Interesting line of attack from Elizabeth. Touché, says Elizabeth. But 20 million pounds suddenly swimming around and only one man knows where it is? That might be tempting. 
I should think so, says Sue. Very tempting. And you, of course, would have had ample opportunity to kill Douglas and Poppy. You knew where they were. You would have access. You would have their trust. You were in charge of putting them there, and no doubt you'll be in charge of cleaning up the mess. Sue nods. I'm beginning to wish I had thought of this now, aren't you? I think I might have thought of a way of doing this without killing anyone, though, says Elizabeth. I hope you might extend me the professional courtesy of imagining that I might have too, says Sue. I worked with Douglas for nearly 20 years. My condolences, says Elizabeth. Now, while we agree that anyone in this room other than Joyce might have murdered Douglas, it does feel that a trip to see Mr. Lomax might be in order. Under no circumstances are you to visit Martin Lomax, says Sue. We'll be dealing with him. Of course, says Elizabeth. Don't visit Martin Lomax. We must try to remember that, Joyce. Joyce nods. Understood. Later, Siobhan identifies the body of her daughter, Poppy. Sue is by her side, and Sue is kind. Now the reader, for the first time, is left alone with Martin Lomax. Uh, Martin Lomax is getting a video call from also a kind person, a kind American mafioso. Listen, we don't <laughs> see the diamonds. <laughs> the American says, we'll kill you. But you know what? I'll kill you, and I'll make it quick. By the way, my wife says hi. <laughs> so obviously these guys are, you know, thick as thieves. Uh, also, the mafioso says, look, I like you. My dad liked you. We've been doing business a long time. So I'll make it quick. Um, yeah, then he hangs up. So, of course, all the old people take a trip. Remember now, <laughs> uh, Elizabeth and Joyce promised Sue that they would not be visiting Martin Lomax. Like, we're Did they stay. promise? This is your case. They didn't yeah. promise. They made they a prom. Mm -mm. which is half a promise. Mm -mm. So, of course, they all take a trip to see Martin Lomax. Bogdan drives. Lomax has no defense against this lot. Um, they share this discussion where he thinks they're there to see the gardens, which they kind of are. He's got beautiful gardens. And then Elizabeth starts asking, asking him questions about Douglas. Like, did you try to have Douglas killed? Okay, because he did. <laughs> And um, Martin's like, well, that would be bad news because I need those diamonds uh, or I'm a dead man. And it's clear he's not joking. And he lets Elizabeth and Joyce know, I don't care how old you are. If you find those diamonds and you don't give them to me, I will kill you. And Elizabeth's like, no, no, it's fine. And he's like, no, I'm serious. And she's like, well, OK, I get it. I'll kill you, too. <laughs> and he, he like questions her a little bit and Joyce is like no she really would I don't think she will but she would <laughs> and so Elizabeth is like great we have an understanding we would kill each other now <laughs> we will try our best to find the diamonds so anyway and he said uh, they she said stick with us because yeah. we're gonna try we're gonna find the diamonds we're way better than the police mm -hmm. I promise yeah so uh, later on, Elizabeth invites Sue, remember, who's like her younger counterpart in right. MI5 or who she used to be in MI5, um, to a session of the Thursday Murder Club. She is cordially invited to the next Thursday Murder Club. There they ask very good questions. Number one, why did Elizabeth, why did Douglas want Elizabeth to come to the house? He texted her. That's how uh, Elizabeth and Joyce even wound up over there and found them dead. But what did he want to show Elizabeth? Elizabeth thinks Douglas possibly killed Poppy and faked his own death. He's that selfish. Also, Elizabeth thinks she knows where Douglas hid the diamonds. A dead letter drop, perhaps. So while they were walking um, back a few days ago and Poppy had on her headphones to give them privacy, he was saying things and kind of dropping clues just in regular conversation. And when they got to a tree, he said this would be a perfect place for a dead letter drop. So maybe he actually did drop a letter there. One thing about well, uh, Elizabeth, I'm sorry. One thing about Elizabeth is that what she knows of um, Douglas is that he's very particular. The way he speaks, everything he does is with purpose. So everything he does, everything he says, he says for a reason. So she can just think back in her mind to that conversation, what was said, and though that would definitely give her all the clues she needs to help fix or solve. 
Yes, because in their marriage, he was very purposeful with his words as he was lying to her constantly. So she knows he don't just be playing with the words. So they do go to that spot. They do find a letter letter with Elizabeth's name on it. Can you explain what the context of that letter is, Alexis? Well, the context of the letter, I have it here. Oh. Ah, listen. He said, if you find this letter, I am dead. (laughs) Um, cause I, I did take that 20 million. Sorry to put you in this, on the spot like that, but I give you a couple of options. Um, let's see. There was something. Oh, he gives her the location of a locker where the diamonds are kept. Yeah. He's like, you'll find the diamonds there in that train station locker, locker. And he gives her the locker number. Yeah. Thank you for that. So he also says a few other things like he still loves her. Yes. Uh, If you don't find the diamonds there, that means I got away with it. And kudos to me. (laughs) Um, So Joyce and Elizabeth visit the locker, but the diamonds are gone. Wait, wait. He was like, meet me there. I will send word to you. If if I'm still living, I'll send word to you. Come be with me. Yeah, we can spend the 20 million together, my love, my one and only love. Okay. So Joyce and Elizabeth visit the locker. The diamonds are gone, but there is a secret note. And it says that this was a test. It's, a, it's all a test. But if you really think about it, Elizabeth, you already know where the diamonds are. What? So she starts going back to like a uh, cottage they spent time in, blah, blah, blah. But no diamonds. The oldie but goodie gang have gathered to watch CCTV around the locker at the station. So they're they're back in Shady Pines. They're back in their assisted living community, but they're watching the CCTV from the train station. Okay, trying to figure out when did he plant the diamonds? Who's been there? Did someone steal the diamonds? What's going on? And they noticed that a figure in a motorcycle helmet visited the locker before Elizabeth and Joyce. That figure, too, found nothing. But who is the figure? Kendrick, who's Ron's uh, grandson, he's super cute, notices a clue. And he's like, did everyone get the clue? (laughs) And everyone's like, no, it's the clue. He's like, look again. So the clue is that whoever did visit was wearing what? A friendship bracelet. So throughout the story, um, Joyce has been weaving friendship bracelets for a charity, and she's very proud of them, although they're ugly. She gives them to her friends. They (laughs) buy them. All the money goes to the charity. Um, The only ones who's really wearing theirs is Bogdan. She sold one to Martin Lomax, who only paid five dollars for one, although he's stinking rich. She's like, what a terrible man. And whoever went to the locker is wearing one of Joyce's friendship bracelets. Later on, Donna who is that officer, uh, the black one with the cute mom who's dating uh, Donna's partner. Donna and Abraham benefit from an impromptu therapy session. Donna is um, suffering from crippling loneliness. Uh, She's trying to hide it, but also seeing her partner and her mom fall in love just really reinforces in her mind how lonely she is. And then she keeps going on these dates with these weirdos, these men who are trash, um, and she's like, I, I need to talk to someone, but therapy is not for me because I'm not crazy. Uh, but I do have a friend who's a retired therapist. So maybe we'll just have a chat. Anyway, it's a therapy session. And uh, a lot comes out. He already notices the loneliness in her. Yeah. Um, and so um, she also notices the fear in him. Yeah. And they're trying to help each other through this valley in their life. Yeah. Abraham uh, is very, very, very intelligent. Uh, Mm -hmm. And he knows right off that you're not coming here to talk about this case. You are coming here to use my psychiatry background. Yeah, because you could have just met with a Thursday murder club, Mm -hmm. but you wanted to talk to me. And I'm happy to talk to you, my dear friend. So um, after that therapy session, they watched the video and... um, Joyce managed actually to get another CCTV. So Joyce is kind and her kindness gets her into places that a lot of other people, including Elizabeth, can't get into. So there's a guard at the train station and Joyce chats her up and finds out that there's another camera that only the guard sees. Um, And the guard was happy to give Joyce a copy of that video as well. After they watch that video, they see who the motorcyclist is. And who is it, Alexis? Uh, Shafan. 
Poppy's mom. Poppy's mom. What? Next time the oldies but goodies are together, Joyce proposes that Poppy found out about the diamonds and the note that was hidden in the um, drop lock, dead drop, sending her mom to collect them. Poppy may even have murdered Douglas and faked her own death, especially since her mom, Siobhan, identified her body. That would have been convenient. Meanwhile, Ryan, remember Ryan? He's the one who pushed over and kicked in the head our dear Abraham. He's hiding out at a cousin's house in Scotland. He's told everyone to call him Kirk, except when he's been drinking, (laughs) he openly calls himself Ryan. So, you know, he's not the brightest. Back at Joyce's house. But he lands, I'm going to start interjecting again. He lands on a final name of Pablo. Yeah, Pablo, like Pablo Escobar. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And of course, Pablo was shot, but that's because he got careless. Ryan won't make the same mistake. (laughs) Poor chap. (laughs) So back at Joyce's house, Joyce is enjoying gin and tonics with her husband, Stephen, and Bogdan, her dear friend. What a fortunate woman she is, she thinks. She looks at the three of them in the mirror. And the mirror, she finally gets it. Douglas said in his letter that the diamonds were in locker 531. Then he gave her a locket containing a mirror after his death. Elizabeth takes Joyce back to the station where they easily open locker number 135. You see, a mirror flips everything. And so uh, that should have gotten her thinking, Douglas thought. And so she easily opens 135. And what's inside that locker, Alexis? Diamonds are a girl's best friend. 20 million. (laughs) 20 million or 20 pounds. Actually, that's a big difference. 20 pounds worth of diamonds. They will use them to catch Poppy and Siobhan. But first, a meeting with the Thursday Murder Club. There they hatch their plan to make it work. They'll need both the police and MI5. Joyce, by the way, easily finds Ryan on Instagram. (laughs) He's dumb. She's not. (laughs) Ergo facto changeo. She finds him. Ryan and Bogdan show up to Connie's house. Con- um, Connie is like super excited to have Bogdan over there again. Ron is pretending to be a gangster. It's very comical. They hand her a few diamonds, a promise of what's to come. If she hands all the diamonds over to their connect. And if she does a good job, there may be a big gig as a drug wholesaler in the future for her. Ron also convinces Connie to bring on Ryan as a driver for the uh, this handoff. So this is the plan. Here we go. There's going to be a meetup. Sue is invited to arrest Poppy as soon as they lure her out. So Sue will be listening to everything from a car nearby. Donna and Chris will be there too. The Italian mafia man who's in town to kill Lomax is also invited. To his annoyance, his car at the airport (laughs) includes Joyce and Elizabeth. And he's like, what is this? But they know everything. So they must know where his diamonds are. The meetup is on a pier. Connie shows up first carrying drugs. Actually, Bogdan's carrying them for her because he's a gentleman. Frank, the American mafioso, arrives with Joyce and Elizabeth. Joyce and Elizabeth climb into a van with MI5. Now the real meeting. So that van drives to a secret location. Everybody arrives to that secret location. It's a secret room. Lomax is there too. And Frank is happy not to have to kill his old friend or old business partner. He really likes Lomax after all. Connie is confused but excited. She hands Franks the diamonds. Two diamonds total. He is furious. Where's the rest of them? And she's like, the rest of them? I don't know. You know, this guy told me to give you these diamonds and I'm giving them to you. What's the problem? An angry confusion settles over the room. In a nearby car, MI5's Sue, along with Joyce and Elizabeth, are listening. Sue is furious. She asks, Elizabeth, why did you give Connie only two diamonds? Because the rest, Elizabeth assures, are kept safe. Okay, no worries. Back in that secret room, Connie is pointing a gun at Frank. Frank is pointing a gun at Lomax. Frank shoots Martin Lomax. Connie shoots Frank. Both men are dead. Connie grabs her drugs and runs to her car. When she opens the door, Chris the police officer and handcuffs are waiting for her. Ryan's already received his handcuffs. (laughs) But where's Poppy? Joyce wonders. Oh, Poppy is dead, assures Elizabeth. 
who's worked it all out in the car on the way there. Sue did it. That's right. The younger version of Elizabeth who works in MI5 as a spy, Sue. Yeah, she killed Douglas and Poppy. She was uh, Douglas's lover, of course. It's obvious. That please call my mom note that Joyce found in her sweater. Mm -hmm. Sue Mm -hmm. planted it. Planted Planted it there. (laughs) Enunciation is is important. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the truth is that Poppy did discover Douglas's note, but she didn't give it to her mom. Oh, no, Poppy was a good girl. She gave it to her boss, Sue. Sue then killed her and Douglas and used a fake Siobhan to retrieve the diamonds, or at least try to. That's the motorcyclist. Sue isn't worried. Quote, unquote, Siobhan, the fake Siobhan, has called her cell phone. They found the diamonds. Where? In Joyce's microwave. <laughs> And so the driver asks for an address or they want to put an address in the GPS system. Sue points a gun at Joyce and asks for her address. Why didn't she just ask Siobhan? What did you ask? <laughs> anyway, drama. On the way to Joyce's home, Elizabeth explains everything she's deduced. She sees the appeal. She assures Sue. Elizabeth was nearly 10 years older than Douglas and Sue is nearly 10 years younger, but they share similar qualities. Obviously, Douglas and Sue were lovers. And when Sue read the note and realized Douglas planned to spend his fortune with his true love, Elizabeth, Sue knew she had to kill him. Mm. An ambulance passes them and Elizabeth fears someone has harmed Stephen. However, when they get to her house, Bogdan shoots Sue. Okay, so this is what happened. Fake Siobhan, fake Poppy's mom, showed up with some rough guys to Elizabeth's house. Elizabeth's husband suffers from dementia, but he's smart as a whip. So he's like, you're not looking for me. You're looking for my wife. (laughs) (laughs) Bogdan walks in because he wants to tell Stephen, his friend, about everything that happened that day. But he sees the ruffians there with fake Siobhan. He quickly uh, tells the ruffians, I'll show you where the diamonds are, but you have to put your guns away because I don't want you scaring the old people when we walk outside. They walk outside. There's a ruckus, some tomfoolery. Bogdan has completely uh, dismantled, if that's the word. Yeah, he's completely (laughs) beaten up these guys. And the ambulance that passed by were holding them, the ruffians. Uh, Siobhan is then told, you need to call your connect, whoever that is. Um, and tell them that you found the diamonds and to come here right away. That's what Bogdan tells her. So then fake Siobhan called Sue and was like, we found the diamonds in Joyce's microwave, which is truly where they were. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they show up to the house. Sue gets shot by Bogdan, who's waiting for them. And it's all very exciting. Um, the operative, Sue, and her assistant, Siobhan, both dated Douglas in the past and both had reason to kill him <laughs> just grief. because they dated him. That's how terrible this man was. <laughs> anyway, um, they're not killed, though. They're held for uh, more operatives to come and collect them. Uh, the old people like tie him up. They're in excruciating pain, especially Sue. And Joyce, who used to be a nurse, says, would you like some painkillers? And Sue <laughs> goes, yes, please. <laughs> and Joyce goes, Sorry. I'm all out. (laughs) Later on, $20 million is donated to a charity of which a volunteer is Sylvia Finch, the woman in our, the beginning of the book, Um, $20 million. And the charity is called Living with Dementia. Right. Okay. The end. Should we take a break? Yeah, let's do that. What was your final verdict of the Thursday Murder Club's uh, second book, uh, The Man Who Died Twice? Would you recommend it? Did you enjoy it? Was it terrible like the first? What are your thoughts? (laughs) Way to lead. Um, I think it was a bit more concise than it was than the first book. Um, The characters all seem to count to me, except the Sylvia that was that I really don't need that. And to give her a name, I mean, and in the prominent place in the beginning, like... Yeah, I don't think that needed to be. Yeah, prologue. That was 
totally mm-hmm. unnecessary in my opinion, but I did love this it, story. Really, I think it should have been like the wedding day of um, Douglas and uh, Elizabeth. And don't tell us who the couple is, just that they know that this will either be the beginning of their great love story or the beginning of the worst period of their lives or something <laughs> like that, you know? That would have been a little fun. I really like how Joy seems to, in her um, her notes to self, she then captures everything that happened. So it's like a quick summary of what just happened. And I love that. I appreciated that. It kept me connected to the story. I thought this story is intriguing. I really wanted to um, get it all in. And uh, I was excited for the verdict. I, not the verdict, for the who done it. And I was following along right with it. I really knew right away that uh, Sue had a relationship with Douglas. Oh. I felt like that was clear in the commentary. And I followed the path of Poppy because I was thinking Poppy was a spy. That fell true. So it was fun to follow along with the story and kind of guess and figure out who did it. Um, yeah, so that was helpful. Again, I think it was far more concise uh, less extra characters, less um, paths to who could have done it. It yeah, was just paths far more. Nowhere. Yeah, it was far more concise and I loved it. I would definitely recommend it to any and all who love it. It is a bit gory, the shooting part, but. Yeah, it's it's still a um... just a reminder. Alexis does not find Jurassic Park uh, gory. <laughs> that book mentions disembowelment about two hundred times. So this is interesting. Please, yeah, please. but it, it, I love the story. I was um, excited about it, so I, I would definitely recommend this book. How about you, Kari? What is your final verdict, and would you recommend this book? Yeah, I agree with you. Um, It's very fun, a very cozy murder mystery. Um, I found the epistolary uh, portion where you're told the details in letter form very, um, although it's convenient, it works. It works very well because um, oftentimes you want to know what Joyce's opinion of everything is. And she's going to bring out who there was cute. You know, she's got her little personality. (laughs) She's very boy crazy, uh, even at what, 70, eight years old or whatever she is. Um, So it's very, very cute. Um, These people feel believable. They are not superheroes. They are just ordinary people with a set of skills. And it's fun to see their friendship uh, develop. Also, the police officers, which is which are like a secondary, almost um, tertiary, sometimes plot point. They they still serve a purpose and you're invested in whether Chris and Patrice, Donna's mom, will fall in love and be married. Um, yeah, so it's very cute. Uh, so, yeah, five stars. A great time. I've read this book twice now and I was thrilled uh, both times reading it. So oh, yeah, I have job. a question. The man who was the man that died twice? That is. Uh, so it depends on what you think. So. Uh, Marcus Carmichael, uh, the real man who played Marcus Carmichael, was a cadaver who died in a way that was uneventful. And then he died again under the name Marcus Carmichael when they used his cadaver to stage the scene. But also Douglas, who uh, people kept thinking was dead, (laughs) remember, or actually alive. So the idea first was that Douglas killed Poppy and faked his own death. And so then they were looking to see where's Douglas. Um, But then they realized, no, that really was his body. It was fresh too, a fresh body. So it was, it was actually him that died. And then lastly, we have people who suffer from dementia, who you lose first um, in their spirit, in a way, because um, they're no longer mentally who they were. Mm-hmm. And then physically, uh, once they fall asleep in death. Um, and that's mentioned in the end by Sylvia, how her husband was a man who died twice because he died from dementia. That is right. I meant to go back and read that. But yeah, OK, I remember that piece. But that was that's clever. I really did enjoy this book. Yeah. I love being back with our um, Thursday Murder Club. I love those characters. They're really. Um, They're really fun characters and they work together really great. Kari, what are we reading next week? We are reading Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. Well, 
Thank you for listening to Lit Society. We look forward to meeting up with you next week, Thursday. Lit Society is brought to you by me, Alexis Anaria, and Kari Herrera. Support the cause by leaving a five-star review for our show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And leave a comment on Apple and Spotify about why you absolutely love us, because we love you too. If you've enjoyed what you just heard, tell a friend about Lit Society. Visit LitSocietyPod.com for show notes, this month's book list, and to sign up for our amazing email newsletter. And until next time, readers, read something. Read something.